Good evening and happy Valentine's Day to all, all of you. Um, welcome to Garden Hour, our special Valentine's edition, uh, brought to you uh, by SDSU Extension. I'm Rhoda Burrows, SDSU Extension Horticulturist, and I will be your host this evening. Tonight's panelists will include Anna Tweet, uh, SDSU Extension Farm to School Nutrition Field Specialist. Anna, would you like to tell us uh, what you're going to be speaking with us about tonight? Yes, I will be talking about gardening and farm to school and the overlap that lies there. Sounds great. And uh, Harry Walkling, SDSU Extension Family and Community Health Specialist, is with us again tonight also. Prairie, uh, do you uh, want to share with us some of the things that you'll be talking about tonight? Uh, it looks like Prairie may be frozen up for the time being, so we'll get back to her. Um, John Ball may be uh, joining us a little bit later. He got caught up in the in that crazy weather that's out there tonight. So, so if he uh, pops up, we'll introduce him at that point. And then I'm going to be talking about keeping Valentine's flowers, um, how to how to save those so that you can enjoy them for longer amount of time, and uh, also. Um, Talking some about starting seed for uh, perhaps flowers later this summer. And uh, um, so we'll get started in a minute here. Again, uh, feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to, uh, to ask any questions you might have, or you're welcome to type in comments in the chat or the Q&A as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Anna. Thank you, Rhoda. Uh, and I did not plan ahead well enough to think about adding something about Valentine's Day into my portion, but I will try to brighten our days with thinking about gardening um, that is to come, hopefully in the not so far away future, uh, just a couple months away. So what is farm to school? Let's just start with the basics there. Um, a definition to get started. Uh, farm to school is a, a broad topic that covers lots of different activities, and those are categorized into three different areas. So the first is procurement. Anytime schools or child uh, nutrition programs sell local produce into um, through their system to to students. Uh, the second is gardens, which we'll go a little bit more in depth on, um, where any student gets. Uh, an opportunity to engage in hands-on learning through gardening, whether that's out of school or if that's um, outside of school, I think both can can qualify as farm to school when it is those kids that are um, of learning age, you know, which which really, I guess, is, is all of us, but um, specifically pre-K through 12 uh, youth gardens. And then education is anything that involves learning about local food systems um, and might include gardening as an educational um, method as well. Uh, so, so why youth gardens? Uh, maybe there's some of you out there who have children or grandchildren or brothers or sisters or nieces or nephews or friends, um, or maybe you run a, a daycare or are involved in children's activities in some sort of fashion. I'm sure that we almost all have some youth in our life in one regard or another. Um, so, so why thinking about including them in gardening? It, it encourages healthy eating. It's great for physical activity. We think about weeding or watering or uh, transporting uh, pots and um, getting everything started. It can include some strength activities as well as the aerobics of maybe standing up and getting back down. And um, it's a good activity for us at all ages and, and the youth are definitely included there. It encourages responsibility, especially when the youth get to control a bit of the garden themselves uh, and, and have that sense of ownership over it. And it teaches patience because we know that gardening can take a long time for uh, the fruits of the labor to show. And especially in this day and age when, when things can be very readily available to us and our youth growing up um, with you know, the high speed technology, this is one method to uh, teach patience. I am gonna share this video that has a great example of a youth gardening program that um, is in Dupree, South Dakota with a youth garden that 
our extension program works with there. So I will get that started now. Anytime a kid gets their hands in the dirt or tastes a new fruit or vegetable, they're more and more likely to grow fond of that fruit or vegetable and eat a variety of healthy foods. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Learning, learning garden. garden! Farm to School is a broad term. It encompasses local food procurement, but it also encompasses youth gardens, which we see here in Dupree, and educational activities that revolve around local foods. Our garden is really a learning garden, and it started as an affiliate of our local YMCA. It's a branch of our programming. We are the YMCA of the seven council fires, and so what happens here is kids from our day camp program come to garden class every day, Monday through Thursday, and we do evidence-based learning that SDSU Extension Office provides for us. And so with that, we try to take advantage of teaching them some of these healthy lifestyle skills that's not just games, but also working in the garden and knowing how to live a healthy lifestyle through what you eat. The garden has created a space to learn about STEM topics, to learn about nutrition, to do an art project, to get hands-on exposure to fruits and vegetables, and it's leading to a start of a nutrition education. One of the programs that we offer at SDSU Extension is called Pick It, Try It, Like It. It's an evidence-based program that provides recipes and activities for all sorts of fruits and vegetables that we can grow in South Dakota. And it provides a good way to get hands-on experience and use a little curriculum without having to come up with it on your own. And the kids, they do everything. They help plant the seeds. They learn where all their fresh produce comes from. They tend the plants and then we get to harvest and then use them in our cooking. Do you remember? where pickles come from? You remember? Cucumbers. Yeah, they come from cucumbers. So all your pickles start out like this. And then what happens is we add like vinegar and sugar and then it turns into a pickle. Every single night the kids get a free hot dinner and so a lot of our vegetables go to that program. And so we're really just trying to do this healthy lifestyle with our kids, which is a core value of the Y and it really fits into work with SDSU Extension Office. Studies show that when kids are involved in growing food, they're more likely to try it. So they're more likely to try the cucumber that they grew themselves in the garden than they are to go to the grocery store and buy a cucumber and actually like it. There's a sense of ownership there that makes them more likely to eat it. All right, which one? I'll let you pick it. Cucumber. How was it? Was it good? You should try this one. It's a Cherokee purple one. In South Dakota, five of the top 10 leading causes of death are chronic diseases, which are nutrition related. So programs like this, which get kids exposed to healthy, nutritious foods from the start, are an evidence-based method to get them to continue eating fruits and vegetables throughout their lifetime and prevent chronic disease. When we start thinking about each community across the state and each community across the nation that's doing little garden programs after school or in the summer and how that impact can seem small on the community level but we replicate that across the state and across the country, we really have a huge potential to impact the, the lives and the health of our kids. Our community is a small one but we are a mighty community and we really try to do our best to come together and service kids through our programming here. You can see the benefits in the kids and you can see the benefits of your community. And so I would say for anyone, it might be a little bit hard to start it, but it's always worth it in the end. Isn't that a fun example um, and inspiring there at the end too that uh, while this is an example that the YMCA did a, a more formalized program around youth gardening, it, it really can be something that happens just in the backyard or on this formal scale. So um, I hope that as we get started with thinking about gardening season just around the corner, uh, that this will place on your minds ways that could, you could maybe involve involve youth. As mentioned in the video, there are some resources out there that support some activities that you could do while gardening with youth. Um, and I'll get to those in just one second, but another one that has just come out uh, that similar to this example of the in the video from Dupree are these South Dakota Farm to School stories that highlight some really awesome programs across our state. And there are a couple in there that are um, 
garden related. And so I welcome you to visit the URL that's listed there and, and search through the programs that have been highlighted and see if they relate to something that you'd be interested in doing. Contact information is there for the people who have um, operated these programs. And so it can be a good place to maybe see what some ideas are that, that you might like to try or just be inspired or, or even just learn about what's going on in the state. Um, because I, I really do think we have a lot of good um, programs going on and a lot of passionate people. One of the activities that we have at SDSU Extension to involve youth in gardening is called Grow Getters. Uh, I've mentioned it on Garden Hour before, but you know, not often enough that it doesn't deserve repeating here. Um, it's garden-based education for preschool through third grades, and there are five lessons coming up. Two are currently available at the URL listed on the page um, on the STSU Extension website. If you just search Grow Getters, it'll take you there, uh, but they teach nutrition, physical activity and science lessons through activities that relate to a concept of gardening throughout the garden season. So we start with an introduction to gardening and end with harvest and preservation. So um, do welcome you to check out those. They're branched into one is for preschool and kindergarten and the other is for first through third grades with some slight differences, of course, in what those age ranges are capable of doing. And the other one that was mentioned in the video is called Pick It, Try It, Like It, Preserve It. And um, even for without using youth uh, gardening as a reason to look at this curriculum, I think that it's worth exploring for anyone because there are some really awesome recipes for lots of the produce that we grow in South Dakota and, and ideas of what to do with it. Um, so something worth checking out. Otherwise, I think before my time is up, I just want to touch on if you do grow a garden and you're interested in farm to school, uh, maybe it's not this youth gardening aspect, but the local procurement aspect, uh, schools and uh, summer feeding sites and child centers and daycares and, and all sorts of locations that operate child nutrition programs can accept donations. And if you have garden abundance, that is one place that you might consider taking them. Um, Similar to if you donated it to a food bank or something, our, our child nutrition programs are a food security program and the kids benefit from them and having fresh local fruits and vegetables that they can get excited about is just wonderful. Uh, so any donations would be, of course, under the discretion of the food service manager to decide on the food safety, of course. Um, if they are willing to serve that to their students, but uh, definitely worth considering. And they are able uh, through regulations to accept whole unprocessed fruits or vegetables. And there's some examples, of course, there on the, the right side, melons, berries, apples, cucumbers, all sorts of things that you might have in your garden. Um, those are the basic requirements to consider selling. Um, and with that, I'll leave my contact information and I am happy to take any questions here in the next couple of minutes that you might have. I'm not seeing any, but that was a fantastic video. That must have been a lot of fun to see that come to come together. Absolutely, it was it was very fun to see. So, and Anna is leaving us not for a hot date, but well, for for part of her job, uh, there's going to be a local gathering of people interested in farm to school um, at one of the local restaurants. Uh, tonight so so she's going to to uh leave us but but we thank you for coming tonight and and taking time out of your valentine's day to be with us thank you and thank you all for taking time out of your valentine's day to listen to me so <laughs> yeah uh next up we'll have prairie and i'll let you take it away prairie <clears throat> All right, good evening. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. My name is Prairie Walkling, and I'm the state lead for the Master Gardener program uh, based out of Rapid City. I'll share some updates tonight. And our agenda, um, in honor of Valentine's Day, I have some brief information on Canadian roses from Cindy Schnabel. I'm gonna talk about the Master Gardener and Home Horticulture course. And then lastly, Growing Together South Dakota, a new program. So for those of you that don't know Cindy, she is a longtime Master Gardener in our 
year-round hotline staff answering your garden questions. And one of Cindy's special interests is Canadian roses. And so thank you to Cindy for sharing this content with us tonight. And Cindy is retiring this year after she, she said I could share it. So um, after serving 11 years at the Garden Hotline. So um, thank you to Cindy for your years of service to SDSU Extension and the citizens of South Dakota. I asked Cindy <clears throat> if she had any memorable hotline calls. And she said that every year tourists from out of state call and ask, where are the sunflowers? And they're, they're coming on a vacation to South Dakota and they wanna take photos of a field of sunflowers. So um, this reiterates that the people love flowers. So as many of you know, red roses are the most popular flower that's given out on Valentine's Day. And many consider them to be the most romantic flower. And a fun fact about me is that uh, my middle name is Rose. So I'm Prairie Rose. And so of course, I'm, I'm a fan of roses. And hardy Canadian roses were bred with the idea that everyone should be able to have their own rose garden. And as they're bred for the Canadian prairies, Incorporating them in your South Dakota landscape is a natural fit. And all of these beautiful photos are taken by Cindy in her garden near Aberdeen. And I put the cultivars on there in case there's one that really strikes your fancy. Um, there are several advantages to Canadian roses. Overall, they're easy to care for. Little or no pruning is required. There's a minimal spraying needed for diseases and insects. And since they're developed to withstand the cold Canadian winters and thrive in warm, humid summers. And lastly, they have their own root stock. So when they die back to the snow line, the plant that emerges in the spring will be true. So although you won't be growing these outdoors in a, in a South Dakota February to give to your Valentine, they, you might wanna try them in your garden anyway. <laughs> Now on to the Master Gardener and Home Horticulture course. Registration is open. The deadline to register is March 10th, unless it fills up before then. We've had a great response so far, but we, we still do have, have openings. This course is your chance to become a Master Gardener and the course only opens once per year. But it's important to know. <clears throat> And I'm gonna provide just a quick review of our mission and, and our program. Our programming mission is to provide current research-based consumer horticulture information and education to the citizens of South Dakota through Master Gardener projects and services. And so as a reminder, above all, Master Gardeners are volunteers. Um, being a Master Gardener is more than just knowing about gardening, it's, it's about sharing that knowledge with your community in a meaningful way. So Master Gardener is a volunteer who's passed an in-depth course, passed the exam and made the commitment to give back 40 hours of volunteer service within a year of completing the course. They're recognized in the community as a professional aide to SDSU Extension, um, bringing, the, bringing the university to the people and they provide vetted research-based gardening information to communities. And in South Dakota, we have Master Gardener Clubs. And these clubs largely drive the volunteer programming that Master Gardeners perform, which is thousands of hours educating citizens about horticulture. There are currently about 16 clubs. Um, a few are are getting pretty small, but they are, they're hanging in there um, with about 400 master gardeners registered across the state. And why become a master gardener? Well, you get to join a community of like-minded individuals, make friends, have fun, make a difference in the community and stay up to date on the most current horticulture information. These are photos of our master gardeners in action around the state. They host 
educational presentations and events, help with questions at farmer's market booths, teach children about gardening, host plant sales, assist at county fairs and state fair. They go on educational bus tours together, you can see, <laughs> and, and much more. The process for becoming a master gardener is outlined here. You're considered a trainee while you're enrolled in training. After you complete that training and pass your test, which is an open book, online test, don't let that scare you, um, you become an intern and begin working on your 40 hours of payback service within one year. After that, you are a certified master gardener. After that 40 hours, your payback obligation is complete unless you wish to continue um, in the master gardener community and we, we hope you will. If you decide to take the training this year, you'll be committing to a March to June timeframe, approximately 12 weeks. The course is mostly online. There are online videos, reading assignments each week, and then a weekly live Zoom session in the evening where you take a deeper dive into the content with our, with our experts. And those sessions will be Thursday evenings and each will last an hour and a half. And there'll be 50 hours of materials covered. So there's a lot packed into it. In one week, you might cover two or three different topics. Um, for example, in our last training, they covered soil health, nutrient management and plant diseases all in one week. Um, in-person sessions are gonna be offered in Hot Springs, Watertown and Yankton. You don't need to live in these communities to participate. You just need to be able to get there um, on, two, on those two required days. And our March, March at the beginning of the course, we're gonna meet for two hours in the evening and participants will meet state staff, club leaders from that part of the state and each other. Um, we'll have an overview of the course, get everyone logged in to the online course. We'll have some snacks too, <laughs> and get ready to go for our first Zoom session, which will be in April. June is gonna be a all day affair with hands-on activities from our primary trainers who you can see there. Dr. Lang, Dr. Burroughs, Dr. Ball, and Dr. Bachman, and plan to be outside part of that time and get your hands dirty, and they'll, those days will be a lot of fun. Now on to Growing Together South Dakota, which is an exciting new mini-grant opportunity for South Dakota communities. I love that Anna talked about um, donating produce because I'm, I'm going to be talking about that too. <laughs> and I put the, the URL in there too for you. So Growing Together is a multi-state snap ed garden project that many of our neighboring states have participated in for several years. And so we're, South Dakota is excited to join these other states. You can see that map there. Um, this project increases access to fruits and vegetables, promotes healthy food access, and provides nutrition and gardening education to individuals and families who are food insecure. So it's a partnership between SNAP-Ed, the Master Gardener Program, and food pantries or um, organizations. And many of you may not be familiar with SNAP-Ed, um, SNAP is also known as EBT or food stamps, and SNAP-Ed is the educational piece of that federally funded grant program, and it's an acronym. It stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education, and as you can see there, with over 200,000 combined pounds of food donated in 2022, this has been a very successful program in other states. Um, it, it will take some time to get off the ground in South Dakota, but all of you listening tonight can, can help spread the word. So 
Many of you have probably heard of Grow an Extra Row. And this is the basic concept behind this effort. According to Ample Harvest, about 11 billion pounds of garden produce is wasted per year. And 80% of gardeners are willing to donate, but they may not know where or how to go about doing it. So Growing Together South Dakota seeks to better coordinate this effort. And most community gardens rent out plots and then people take home their produce. That's the, the typical model, right? But this is kind of ratcheting it up a notch for a typical community garden because the garden's committing to donate a portion of what they grow to those in need, either a food pantry or an organization that serves low-income individuals, such as um, like a shelter. And these gardens are also committing to providing education and must involve a master gardener. So I'm gonna share an example of an eligible project. So imagine with me <laughs> that there's a, a boys and girls club in South Dakota and they decide to develop a garden at their site. Um, the club will provide fiscal management of the project. They decide all the produce is gonna go to club members because they want them to consume more fruits and vegetables. And they're gonna weigh um, their, their harvest and record it. Um, the Boys and Girls Club then talks to their local master gardener club and asks if they would come in and provide some education once a week. And they agree to that. And so this is set up. So donation to a qualifying site, check. Fiscal sponsor, check. Master gardener involvement, check. Gardening education, check. Now they just need to fulfill the nutrition education requirement. Um, they review the options and they decide to provide taste tests using SDSU extension approved recipes. So they create their budget and they add supplementary, supplementary grocery items as an expense because one of their approved recipes they wanna make is fresh garden salsa. So they're gonna need, um, uh, to buy a lime, salt, and chips to go along with the tomatoes, peppers, onions, and cilantro that they plan to grow in their garden. So they add these items to their budget, um, as well as they add some other items like seeds, plants, produce scale, some garden tools. Their budget gets approved. Um, they make the purchases according to the submitted budget, keep their receipts, after they're done, they turn those in, they get reimbursed. Um, in August, SDC Extension mem staff member comes and visits their site. In September and October, the club, with help from the master gardeners, submits their final report. So I hope that kind of helps explain what the project might look like. Um, it, it, it's not, it could be, um, there are variations, of course, but I just wanted to provide an example of what that could look like. We have 10 mini grants available at $500 each. And our first consideration date will be March 1st. And our last consideration date is June 15th. And there is a need for this in South Dakota, um, as illustrated here by Feeding South Dakota. Um, and we hope that this program will be able to do some good. So if you have questions, please reach out to me. Um, there is a, the application is on the website and um, some FAQs and some lots of good resources, ideas of um, what to grow and how to, how to set up your project. Also, I just wanted to share some, the Master Gardeners have lots of spring events coming up, um, lots of good stuff. Wanted to share some of those. Uh, Minnehaha Master Gardeners in Sioux Falls will be having Gardening with the Masters. Uh, that's a Saturday, March 25th. And you can see the sessions there. Um, Pennington County Master Gardeners are hosting Gardening in the Black Hills. 
Um, and I'm I'm not promising that these events aren't full, but <laughs> but um, want to, want to let you know about them. And these um, gardening in the Black Hills are evening sessions um, on lots of different topics, and the there is a fee, but they're they're very reasonable. Langton County Master Gardeners also have spring fever coming up. And that's uh, Saturday, March 4th. You can see there's speakers there. And in Miller, they're hosting a spring fling garden, garden party. That's on April 1st. And Missouri Valley and Yankton, they'll be, they're hosting their spring fling coming soon. Um, so save the date for March 28th that evening. And um, just sharing, um, of course, you can find us on the website and our Facebook page. And there's my contact information. Thank you. Did I have any questions? You, you have one question about the Canadian roses. And oh. that was what was the name of the red one? Okay. So And I forgot it too, so <laughs> I have to yeah. let you go back to your slides and look. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to check on that. Cindy's the expert on those. <laughs> and I, if if uh, if I can't get back there, I can. Well, here we go. I can definitely um, email her. Too. Okay, so. The I think it's the artist series Never Alone Rose. Oh, which seems appropriate for Valentine's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had a question about you mentioned on the on the grant program um, the website. Where where should they look for information on this? It's uh, on our extension website. Okay. And so extension.sdstate.edu and go to what food and family or to the garden um it is i can put it in the chat okay yeah growing together south dakota all right there we go. <laughs> thank you yeah oops i just turned myself off okay there um, so I'm going to take it, take the reins now, and uh, uh, and I think I need to switch these. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so I thought that tonight, I mean, many of you may be getting flowers and want to keep those beautiful flowers a little bit longer. Uh, so I've put in some tips for being able to do that. Uh, the first thing you want to do is sort of measure it against your vase and remove any of those leaves that would be underwater uh, because they'll contribute uh, to bacteria and so forth that would start rotting in the water. So you want to get rid of those. Um, you want to cut off the bottom inch of stems, kind of like you do with Christmas trees, so it can take up fresh water. If you can hold it either underneath in a pail of water, hold it underneath the water, or I always just do it under running water with it. Make sure your knife is clean or you use clean pruners. Again, we're trying to, to get rid of any bacteria that might start uh, some rot going. Um, and then place in water immediately after cutting so it doesn't have a chance to, for air to get in there. You keep, keep a, a good cut surface that's going to take up the water. Uh, again, place in a clean vase. You're sort of getting the idea here. Uh, filled with warm water. Uh, warm water will be taken up better by the flowers than cold water. And if most of the times if you buy uh, flowers or bouquets uh, at 
at a florist or, or even the grocery store now, there'll usually be some floral food in there. Be careful, take, take a look at the instructions and see how much that's supposed to be diluted. Don't just take the whole thing and, and throw it in regardless of the size of the vase. Because if you get it too high, uh, it can impair the, the ability of the, the, uh, the preservative to, to work correctly or if too low. So do pay attention to that. And then change the water daily or or at least every other day at, at the most. And when you do that, you may have to recut the stems just like you did the first time. And that will help keep them be able to take up water and that will keep them fresh longer. Uh, you want to keep at temperatures between 50 and 75 degrees. Um, one of my one of my good friends from graduate school was a floriculture professor at North Carolina State, and I was reading one of his uh, bits of advice to people, and that is that uh, I guess there's kind of an old wives' tale. Uh, put in a couple drops of vodka, and the idea there is vodka actually may inhibit the ethylene production, and ethylene is that ripening compound that ripens your bananas, but it will also cause your flowers to go bad quicker. So, so if you happen to have some vodka around, give your flowers a couple drops of it. Now, people are getting very eager to uh, start seeds, getting eager now as you know we had 60 degrees the other day and in yesterday even in uh, rapid and so it's hard not to think about gardening so if you want to start some seeds there are some that that need that long uh starting onions pretty quick here onions and leeks uh take uh several months actually to to get going um microgreens this would be for harvesting in the house, not for planting out. But some of these other spinach, because it's a very uh, cold resistant crop, can be uh, planted now in celery. Uh, looking at flowers, delphinium, dianthus, foxglove, petunia, pansy, verbena, all of those take a while to germinate and get going. So uh, they can be planted or they can be seeded now if you're going to start your own seed. But you don't want to start things like broccoli or cabbage. It's a little too early for those. If you start them too early, they get too big. And then when you transplant them, um, it's enough of a shock to the system that it might not uh, form, like in broccoli, it might not form a good head. It might just end up sort of bolting and, and uh, producing little shoots instead of a nice head. Uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, they'll get too big <laughs> uh, before being able to plant them out if, if you start them now. Wait until March. Uh, all our cucurbits, cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, I myself just prefer direct planting them and not bothering with transplants. But if you want to use transplants, you only want to give those a couple weeks. They'll come up real strong. And if they get too large, I've seen, you know, in the stores, I've seen them uh, sometimes a foot, two foot long. That's way, way, way too big a plant to transplant well. So you want to hold off on those. Most flowers would be started in March. Uh, Xenia, uh, you can wait until April. And if you're wondering about looking up specific crops that I haven't mentioned here, or you can't take all these down in a little bit, um, at johnnyseeds.com, if you go into their growers library, they have grower information. They actually have a seed planting schedule calculator and you put in when you think your last frost date is going to be, and then it'll pop in and tell you what to plant when for starting the transplants. So that's pretty cool. Um, speaking of last frost date, uh, this is the uh, most recent information, 1991 
through 2020. So this has been updated from some of our older publications with the information from the last 20 years, which as you know, has been affected to some degree by global warming. So we see um, in the Southeast part of the state last day, 50% uh, chance of, of uh, that the last spring frost will be by that date. And, and we're looking at uh, the end of April, beginning of May for the southeast part of the state, and then as we go west, it tends to be later. Uh, so even in rapid, we're looking at um, about the third, not quite middle May, a little bit earlier, probably, depending on the year. So, so you can use this and check your location and across the top climate sdstate.edu and then click on tools and then it'll have frost dates and and you can play around with this particular uh, uh, this particular uh, website and you can put in 28 degrees when's 50 percent dial for 28 degrees or if you like to load your bets 90 percent percentile instead of 50 percent probability so uh, you can you can adjust that as you like it's kind of fun to look at how that changes just to uh, talk about a little bit more about our seating uh, if you the results that you get with your transplants are going to depend on what you start with so garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. Uh, you need to use quality seed. Uh, if you're saving some from last year, a couple years ago, and you're not sure what the germination is like, uh, you can put them in damp paper towels, uh, just loosely wrap it in plastic so it doesn't dry out. Uh, wait, you know, a few days to a week or two weeks, even depending upon. Uh, how quick your seed germinates and then open that up and see how much of it germinated and and you can actually pick them off the paper towel and plant them if you want at that point. Uh, on the on the right here we have some examples of looks like corn um, with good germination on the left and really poor germination on the right. Uh, so your seed can make all that difference. So, you know, if you've been having trouble getting getting good germination, pay attention to uh, what kind of seed that you're getting in the first place and how it's stored. Uh, transplants, I still actually kind of like cool fluorescent uh, lights for transplants because I've had the best luck with those. However, you can spend a lot of money uh, to get LED grow lights, and they should be in the right uh, wavelengths for photosynthesis then. And those are becoming more and more common and a little less expensive when, than when they first came out. Uh, you can you can spend, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars to get a beautiful cart like this with the with the trays and, and the lights, or if you're low budget, you can make your own uh, setup with, in this case, fluorescent lights, but you could also do this with LED and uh, chains here so you can adjust the lights up and down as the plants grow, um, starting keeping the, the lights within a couple inches of, of where the, the uh, plants are so as they grow you you raise that up uh, generally we're looking at like 16 hours a day is a good time length for uh, germinating seedlings um, most of them we're, we're kind of looking at uh, cooler room temperatures as low as 55 at night 75 during the day if you actually reverse that so your your days are cooler than your nights if you have the possibility of doing that in your house um, it helps keep the the stems shorter and that's something that commercial growers will do is is reverse that so it has cooler days than nights uh, some of us can do that some of us couldn't so uh, it's a good idea to use a fan once once they're up and germinated, or uh, just take and, and brush them like brush your uh, 
uh, arm over them lightly uh, a couple times a day, that releases a little bit of ethylene, uh, which ethylene helps keep the stems stockier and shorter. I thought I'd just show you some examples to get you excited about the coming season. Uh, these are the 2023 All-American Selection winners. Um, you may not see these in the catalogs until next year, but uh, this one is a what they call personal size melon. They're about the size of a cantaloupe, um, and they're mostly seedless. You can see some seed in there, uh, but that watermelon looks really good to me. Uh, there's a tomato, paste tomato here, aroma tomato. Uh, this was an All-American selection specifically for the Midwest. And it's a bushy plant, but it's indeterminate. So it keeps keeps bearing. And look at the size of those uh, aromas. That's, that's a pretty good size. Um, this particular one is known for having good blossom and rot resistance. So uh, if you're looking for a good paste tomato. This one uh, just shouts flavor to me when I look at it, uh, that dark red interior. Uh, this one also is an indeterminate. This one I put in particularly because it has some resistance to tomato spotted wilt virus. So if you've ever had a problem with that, and we've had some problems with that in different areas of the state, including Rapid, um, that might be one that you'd particularly want to look at. And Wildcat uh, is a new one, a cayenne pepper with a smoky flavor with sweetness. Um, just looks like it's, it's ready to, to put on your table. And with that, um, I'm going to quit sharing here, other than to let you know that we're not having a garden hour during March. Uh, we're going to be busy getting the, the uh, uh, Master Gardener program up and running, but we will have one in April and then starting our regular weekly schedule in May. So. We see some, thank you, Prairie, for dumping in the uh, URLs into the, to the chat box. Yeah, I, I did have one question um, from someone that wanted to attend the Minnehaha Master Gardener mm -hmm. event and said they couldn't find it on our website. And we don't, um, we don't typically put club events on our extension website, but I did, um, there is an event right for that event and I, I did put that in the chat too. Okay, so if you're interested in that, check out the chat and make sure that you click on that before you, before we leave tonight. Well, is everybody uh, going to uh, Go out and celebrate Valentine's in the in the snow now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I my husband is out of town, so uh -oh. <laughs> no romance for me. <laughs> I'll be I'll be home. Um, and it's and it's not it's not a great night to be out. I every hope everyone stays safe out there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hopefully John Ball got home okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we want to remind you that if you have questions throughout the season, our garden hotline is going to be down for until we, <laughs> I think after the 22nd, until we're able to hire new people. But you can always go to the extension website and click on the garden and then the garden problems. And at the bottom of that website is a form that you can fill out with your problem and it's called Ask Extension. And you can fill that out and, and uh, it gets sent around to a bunch of us so um, you can get an answer that way, hopefully. Well, I do see one more question. 
um, look, Anne Ann <laughs> is looking for seeds of a previous award winner. I assume a, a Amer All American Selections Award winner, seeds for a previous award winner. Do you know where she could find those? I did notice on the website, if you go to allamericans.org, uh, I believe it is, or allamericanselections.org, um, you already put the <laughs> URL in, um, mm -hmm. and click on that particular winner, or look up that particular winner. They do have a, a drop down that tells you what companies may have it. So I, I did that earlier today with the with that green zebra tomato and and uh, it uh, park seed is one that has a lot of those. So, uh, so you can try that. Yeah, I, I see that. I see and that the, like I said, the 2023 winners may not be uh, available quite yet. Uh, most of those are are tested at sort of the uh, breeding company level and then and then get bought by you know burpees and and so forth and park seed and and that level so sometimes that takes a year and i see one more question here <laughs> um ann is looking for a determinant pot tomato she used to get terenzo but she can't seem to find them anymore any suggestions what size was that? A determinate pot tomato. Hmm. That I, I don't have any ideas right offhand, but uh, you can try the Master Gardener Facebook page and ask there, and I, I bet you'll get a lot of answers to it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great idea. There are so many great tomatoes that are starting to come out now that that we're starting to get our flavor back from <laughs> from the years of breeding, looking only at disease resistance and not really how how good eating the tomato was. But I think we're getting past that now. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Prairie, for hanging in with me here. <laughs> and uh, we wish all of you good night. Yes, good night.